and switch topics and countries, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Liu, who's going to, from, he wants your corporate identification, yeah, the Cine, uh, startup company from uh, Vancouver, working on, uh, among other things, beta carbolines. And uh, he's going to talk to us about the history of psychoactive plants and fungi in Chinese medicine. So thank you very much for coming. Oh, thanks, Looking forward to it. Sorry, just before I get started, I, uh, I just kind of have to. Everyone smile. <laughs> All right, I promise you that will be hashtag ESPD55. All right, I'm Jonathan Liu. I'm the co-founder of Visena, a drug discovery company that's focused on compounds that come from the Far East that are understudied in Western medicine. And, you know, cat's out of the bag. I'm also Chinese. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart personally and culturally, but also for professional R&D interests, as we'll talk about a little bit here. So uh, when I first uh, uh, talked about some of the compounds that we have been working with with Dennis, I brought up the initial question, which was, of course, um, what compounds uh, are, have been used in Chinese history or from the East? And that brought me to more of a second level question that was of particular interest, which is, why is this area so understudied, considering what a large population this is? If I, I look across at the five ancient civilizations of the world, there has been a, a storied and historic reverential use of psychedelics throughout the evolutionary history of the Mayan civilization in the Americas, the uh, ancient Egypt and, and uh, Mesopotamia across the Fertile Crescent, the Indus Valley. And yet, uh, if I look at China, which is one of the five oldest civilizations, there is none. Are we to believe this? Uh, you know, those uh, I, I, I always love uh, with my Lebanese and Greek friends, um, something that our old civilizations always have in common is that we love talking about how you know, our culture has discovered everything in this world. So that's especially then puzzling to me of why is there no talk about the Chinese discovery of psychedelics? So if I reference then here Richard Schulte's magnum opus, Plants of the Gods, he's got a, a wonderful page within this book here where he talks about the native use of major hallucinogens. And he has mapped out within this page here some compounds such as Amanita muscaria, uh, Atropa belladonna, cannabis, of course, uh, psilocybe strains of mushrooms. And yet then it maybe it becomes a little bit more clear. If I take this same map and I overlay it with a map of uh, global population density by country, where the darker the red is, this is the, the more populous countries, there's a, a very apparent outlier from this map that's here. And you may have seen this trope here that more of the world's population live inside of this circle than outside of it. And why is so much of this circle still blank? Uh, and uh, I, I also within this circle, I, I must also admit that this includes some very significant countries like Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea that have a, a long story juice that I have not researched. Um, maybe depending on how the pace of research at our company goes over the next five years, I can come back at ESPD 60 to talk about them. Uh, but the focus of today will be on, uh, on China. Um, now, I, I am not the first person that's actually presented this question. Uh, there has been a wonderful researcher from uh, Western China who works at the Hebei Provincial Museum. His name is Wang Jitao. And he wrote this, this uh, great paper in 2006 about the ancient shamanic use of hallucinogens in China, uh, which well deserves to be translated. Uh, but he actually presented this same question here. Is it because the Chinese are so rational that we don't use hallucinogens in religious activities? Or are there no similar intoxicating plants in China? I'm not so certain. And this has become the thesis for where I want to spend the next few minutes of this talk here really addressing some of the questions that he had brought up. So uh, over the, the course of the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to go through a bit of an overview of what I'll call an altered timeline of China, highlighting a couple of key events throughout the use of psychedelic and psychoactive medicines. We'll talk a little bit about some of the pharmacology and chemistry of compounds within um, uh, China. Uh, and then having gone through a bit of a history about the past, we can then look towards the future of what does this tell us about what will be coming. And personally, I also have an agenda here to help answer some of these questions brought earlier, which is number one, yes, there was a significant use of hallucinogenics. Uh, two, we Chinese are no more rational uh, or just as emotional as everyone else, although there are some cultural reasons why we actually try and pretend it to be that way. Uh, and, and three, I want you to also walk away that there are many firsts that my country discovered first. 
So we start first with a, a bit of a Chinese lesson here. There's three words of, of, of importance. Uh, Chinese language is, is pictorial, where each word is a subset of other words. And these words are wu, du, and gu. Now I'm going to start here first with the word wu, which roughly translates as shamanism. Um, pictorially, this is a word that's comprised of a couple of subwords. That's ren and gong, which means person and work. And if you look at it pictorically, it's really poetically beautiful here of, of a, what I think is a, a great depiction of even Chinese use of shamanism, which is two people dancing around a pillar or perhaps people doing work together. I mean, something that's really positive and beautiful from some of ancestral history. Now, if I go to the other side of gu, uh, this is a word that uh, if you look, I have also written in the traditional Chinese, originally is the, the, a combination of some derivatives called tong, which is a, kind of like an insect or a vermin, and min, which is a container. Uh, and this originally came from uh, what was uh, an ancestral use of, call it uh, uh, five poisons put together in a jar. And, and this was uh, around fifth or sixth century uh, AD in China, where there was a practice of taking five highly toxic uh, uh, um, animals, I'll call them, worms, uh, spiders, centipedes, scorpions, and, uh, and snakes, and putting them all together in a jar with kind of the, the victor that comes out would have the most potent poison that would be used for venom. Uh, and this one obviously has a very negative use, which was then appropriated towards later times when plagues and infestations came towards the country. Now, the most important word here is du, the one in the middle, which has a dual meaning that could be either seen as uh, poison or perhaps translated as potency. Uh, and this, uh, if you look at the, the nature of what du means, it comes from the, the origins of life, uh, or a word that's similar to plant and mother. So clearly not a negative uh, word here, and it's really connotating that the poisons that are here also are used in bringing life and restoring life. And that ties very similar to uh, two uh, idioms that have been uh, gone through Chinese history for about 4,000 years, si yao san fen du and yi du gong du, which is uh, every medicine is part poison, and we use poison to fight poison. So 1,500 years before Paracelsus, the Chinese had a strong concept of <laughs> the dose makes the poison. So if we begin on the timeline here of where were psychedelics first used within China, here's the answer to the question. The answer is yes. Um, uh, cannabis sativa was discovered as early as 6,000 BC in Neolithic era of China. Uh, and we may not consider cannabis to be psychedelic. The Chinese certainly did. Um, but uh, there was uh, evidence of this use of not only for a fabric, as a row crop, uh, in shamanic uses, but strongly, uh, much more so rather than, than smoking or consuming, was actually used for making a type of wine that was used in shamanic practices. Now, the shamanic use of uh, uh, back in this era here was really no different than the rest of the world. Uh, this was at a time here when religion, medicine, spirituality were all intertwined, and there really is no difference between any of them. I mean, they were all used for the same purpose of trying to heal, trying to bring social cohesion together, uh, and we also had a lot of ancestral worship similar to another culture, such as worship of the sun, worship of fertility gods, and the sky. Now, flash forward a little bit to the 800-year Zhou Dynasty, which was one of the first uh, uh, closest unified or early types of, of pre-imperial China, uh, when we had the advent of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, so the Wuxing philosophy, similar to what we've seen in the West from you know, earth, air, wind, and fire, but also incorporating some other elements, such as metals, as a, a key element of traditional Chinese medicines has been not just plants, not just animals, but also the minerals. Um, this concept still exists today in a lot of TCM practice. Um, around about 1000 BCE, there's also when probably the most common drug that was used throughout uh, Chinese medicinal as well as shamanic history came, and that's fuzi, this uh, aconite plant. Um, similar to uh, what David Nutt brought up earlier here, very high in some of the tropane type of alkaloids, uh, containing heocyamine, scopolamine, and atropine. And it was used both in shamanic purposes as well as at this time when traditional Chinese medicine started to emerge from that of early religious or spiritual use, it was begun to be used uh, much more medicinally, as we see here from this quote here, that it is a very, very potent poison. If I take the, the duality of that type of word, do again, um, yet a good doctor always packs and stores it because it is useful and held many therapeutic uses, both orally as well as, uh, as topically in terms of an ointment. Um, 
Also noticeable to, to point out at this time here is that this was the era in which Lao Tzu and uh, Confucius were both born, although their impact would not be felt until many years later when they had a tremendous impact on both the development of the culture and of psychedelics. And now, the last thing I'll point out here is, as you uh, know from the uh, names of, uh, of the eras here, it's called the Warring States Period for a reason. Um, much of the, the geopolitical history of China has always been because of the separation of, of a desert, mountains, and sea, rather than necessarily what we would call like an external conflict. China had always been, uh, been dealing with internal conflicts of a very diverse group of people uh, warring together to try and form one nation. And warring states kind of implies what the nature of the time was like. So not surprisingly, after warring states, when we had the first unified uh, China under the Qin Dynasty, this is a very short-lived but very impactful dynasty, you had what I might call uh, the world's first uh, military dictator, about 200 years before Caesar. Uh, unsurprisingly, after this period of uh, warring states, when we finally had unification, we had uh, a totalitarian dictator that really ran as a despot. Uh, and unfortunately, so much of the early history from the past 2,000 years um, writing was, uh, was uh, first popularized about 1000 BCE. Much of that was, uh, was lost to time just because of an intentional burning of books you know, around the similar time as uh, what happened within Alexandria, as well as uh, an intentional just murdering of many scholars that carried so much knowledge with them. So we unfortunately lost much of this to history. Um, but it, important to note out from um, this character, uh, Emperor Qin Shi Huang, uh, was that uh, as a, a despot, as you might expect, some of the things that he did do that are well known are completing the construction of the Great Wall of China, building the Terracotta Warriors in Xi'an, where he's actually still buried today, um, and instituting an institution of uh, standards of weights and measures that was critical for future scientific and economic development to occur. Um, I think that there, there were no trains uh, at this time, but it would be safe to say that he made the donkey carts run on time within China. Um, but it, it, importantly, uh, I also want to note just in relation to the, the use of psychedelics and the use of psychoactives that he was obsessed with immortality. And it's actually believed that he is still buried in Xi'an, ensconced inside of a chamber of mercury. Um, and he had sent actually many missions out to go search for this faded and, uh, and legendary immortality elixir. So naturally what happens after you have uh, often a dictator who institutes some level of order is then you have uh, kind of the, the first major dynasty of China, the Han Dynasty, which was an era of progress, of economic development, and scientific development. Uh, it was at this time here that uh, Confucianism, which uh, a loosely term Confucianism, is, it was more of a co-opting of, um, of the words of Confucius for more of political purposes, as China at this time was about 65 million people. It's about a third of the world's population. Uh, it needed some type of a bureaucratic structure in order to organize and, and keep uh, uh, from going back into a warring states period. So we, we started to have a government that was supporting a lot of scientific research, a lot of literature publications, um, such as the, the Divine Farmer's Materia Medica. Um, this is from a legendary character that was on my title slide named Sun Nong. Uh, he's known as the Divine Farmer who brought many agricultural innovations to China such as the use of the plow, uh, uh, many of the row crops and staple crops that helped the country to uh, uh, avoid famine. Um, and he had himself categorized about 365 different uh, Chinese medicines into this, uh, this book that was then passed down orally and written around, uh, around 200 BCE. Uh, it's believed that he existed uh, about 3,000 years prior, uh, but not exactly known, and, and it's likely that he was a composite of multiple important people, and probably some women as well. Um, but uh, uh, I, I like to think of him as an early Sasha Shulgin. As, you know, if you look at, uh, at the book that he's categorized, he did so by personally sampling all 365 <coughs> drugs. And I mean, this book is really amazing uh, if you read some of the descriptions within it. Uh, they really read like early trip reports um, about what happens when you take any of these compounds. Um, but the, the most important thing that, of these different compounds, how he categorized them, was purposely by Du by poison or by potency. Um, so this was a very important element throughout the early development of, of medicine, spiritual use, of the use of poison as a medicine. Um, a couple of other things of noticeable importance during this time. Uh, this was when the Silk Road had been constructed and we started to have a, of an early globalization of trade, particularly with India, uh, which brought Buddhism into the country. Now, 
with the uh, advent of a new political structure under Confucianism, and now Buddhism entering together with, uh, with Taoism, um, there was a competition for state resources. And we like to think today, and has been the case for about a thousand years, that these three different religions or political structures and philosophies have all peacefully coexisted. But that was anything but the case at the time. Um, they, they were warring, they were fighting, and at this time, Buddhism had gained much more of the favor with Confucianism for um, you know, many reasons of, uh, of chance and history, that that was actually were highly oppressed at the time. Uh, and they were, uh, were significantly important towards the actual development of many of these medicinal uses. Um, and including some of these additional plants that uh, we brought up here, uh, Langdang, which is uh, Chiosimus uh, um, niger, similar also to a trope of Eladana, another tropane, alkaloid, uh, containing a, a plant. And of course, Datura, that then came from India, became commonly used as well, together with Fuzi or Aconite. So when the Han Dynasty finally fell, it was actually due to a military rebellion by the, the Celestial Masters, a, a group of uh, Daoist religions that had been historically repressed for a long period of time. Uh, and this was an important era in which we had really peak du or, or poison slash uh, potency pharmacology use. And many, many prolific publications were written during this time, including this one called Baopuzi from uh, Ge Hong, who was a, a, a legendary Daoist uh, who went to spend 20 years on a mountain uh, meditating and working on his different elixirs for reaching transcendence. Um, it, interestingly, uh, as David also brought up before around the use of some compounds such as scopolamine, uh, within these books here, and, and even some of them that go back uh, to about uh, 100 BCE, there were many, many different elixirs that were categorized for how to reach transcendence. So one of them for, uh, of particular interest would have been uh, the mixture of something like scopolamine together with, uh, with uh, a plant called mahuang or ephedra. And if I think about scopolamine, a deliriant that would, uh, you know, I guess the downside from a therapeutic use is much more that it can be difficult to remember what happened under that state. Now, it's interesting to think about why then would it be interesting to combine that together with a stimulant um, like ephedra? And perhaps there are some very interesting properties that come as a result of mixing these two together. And anyways, that's, that's become the, the focus of a lot of what we do at Visayana is to try and figure out these combinations to hit all the, the very interesting targets rather than having a single molecule. Uh, also, uh, at this time, the last thing I want to point out is uh, this is when, when the goo, um, the, the much more venomous or seen as the kind of the bad poison, really came to be in use here as it was seen as a demonic source of illness. Um, and you know, also very similar to, I, I think a lot about uh, the thesis that Ryan Marescu brought up with the immortality key of early occult Christianity and the role of women who are highly oppressed as some of the harbingers of knowledge. The exact same was the case here within China as well. Um, so on the, the plus side, I could say that um, uh, women had a very important role in the advent of medicine and spirituality of China. And perhaps on the negative side, I could say that China was also first at religious misogyny. So one quick note on Taoism that I wanted to interject, which is oftentimes brought up of, is it a religion? Is it a philosophy? Is it both? Um, and the truth is, it is a little bit of both. Uh, it's oftentimes been co-opted to be more of a philosophy, and that goes back to uh, 15th century when a lot of European Jesuits started to come to China, which um, I'd say a little crudely for backwards compatibility, it was much easier to find elements of a philosophy rather than to try and convert a different religion. Uh, but there are some key elements of Taoism that have been fundamental to Chinese culture as well as to Chinese medicine, and that's particularly this concept of non-binary duality. So uh, as I list here some, some quotes from a wonder, wonderful book here from uh, Professor Yan Lu from SUNY Albany called Healing with Poisons that I recommend everyone to, to at least take a look at. Uh, he talks a lot about the concept of these Taoist principles of yin yang or how this non-binary nature was really pervasive throughout Eastern medicine. Um, as we think about medicine, it is even just the concept of do. It's not just a poison, it's also a medicine. Everything has its transformative nature. Uh, and there is no concept of side effects within Eastern medicine. So we think about it from a pharmacological standpoint of trying to, 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 uh, to define a very single and specific target. And there are no off targets in Eastern medicine. All of these are, are part of the, the whole, which is intentionally designed to be a way. Uh, and as an important part for us to all think about is we are entering a new paradigm shift that psychedelics also can bring for mental health care. 
Now, uh, after the, the fall of the Han Dynasty, the next major dynasty that came later was the Tang Dynasty, um, which really emerged uh, after there was the use of, of uh, this was probably the most popular drug or pharmacology used throughout China. It's known as Ususan, which means literally a five stone powder, uh, a highly toxic uh, powder made of many different heavy metals, including mercury and arsenic. Uh, originally consumed for, as a stimulant um, for, uh, for therapeutic uses during meditation to try and reach transcendence, uh, but then also then co-opted as much more of a recreational drug by the elite. Uh, and unfortunately, just due to some knowledge around toxicology of the time, uh, or the lack of knowledge of toxicology at the time, many people died as a result of taking this, including five emperors. So it was not much of a surprise that when the Tang Dynasty uh, came in place, they instituted some very specific and strict drug regulation laws, um, really akin to having the first FDA and DEA of the world. Um, you know, they commissioned the, you know, the, the first uh, government-sponsored medical text here, and it's, it's really fascinating to read some of these books that they have. They have some very specific rules even for drug diversion, as in like, how many kilograms of plants can you actually carry on the back of a donkey? So. No. Very, uh, very just revolutionary for what they had done in the times of, in terms of creating this kind of scholar official bureaucracy. Uh, and then one other, and the, following the Tang Dynasty, we then had uh, a couple of, uh, of years later uh, also uh, another impactful and long-lasting dynasty known as the Song Dynasty. Uh, this is here what I'll call the rise of Neo-Confucianism, which similar to the original purpose of Confucianism in the Han Dynasty, served to exist because we now had a country of about 100 million people, you know, still about 30% of world population at the time, and uh, the need to, to bring order as the country was growing, and you know, certainly compared to Europe at the time, significantly much more technologically, politically, and economically advanced. It was highly important to have this organizing structure. So in, in some ways, Confucianism became perversely adapted in order to become this principle for how to have organization over people. Um, it was at this time here that, uh, that so many of the values that are you know, perhaps now epigenetically coded into people like myself became so prevalent, uh, such as this emphasis on rationalism, intellectualism, technocracy. Um, the, the government even went so far as to ban shamanism or woo altogether. Uh, and the use of pharmacology for reaching transcendence had almost then completely become non-existent by this point. I think clearly as an impact that we've seen politically of the institution of you know, the, the DEA in the, the prior dynasty of the Tang dynasty. So Taoism at this time still, and, and Buddhism and Confucianism, this is the time period where the three started to really coexist peacefully together and they started to merge many different elements of each other together. Um, so for instance, uh, Taoism, uh, while we have had the lessons of many of these Taoist masters for years teaching us about their pharmacologies, it was at this time that because of the, the reduction in the use of Du, that they started to adapt from an outer alchemy to more of an inner alchemy of using meditation and, and internal practices with the same goal of reaching transcendence. Um, and not that one is necessarily better than the other, but one is certainly faster and much more efficient than the other. Now, I'd also be remiss that if we're talking about the history of drugs in China, the big elephant in the room that we have to talk about, I'll flash forward a couple hundred years to uh, the obvious uh, big elephant, which is the opium war. Um, this has had a lasting impact on Chinese culture, psyche, society, economy for, for a couple hundred years since then. Um, if I just give a quick synopsis for anyone who doesn't uh, remember, um, during a time when um, you know, our host country here was the, the rulers of the world as they were expanding their empire, uh, they were beginning to import a high level of spices and tea from countries like China and India, and that led to a major trade imbalance. Now, how do you economically rectify that trade imbalance is that um, many of the Western powers, particularly the, the United Kingdom, began to export opium to China to get the, the people hooked on it in order to have an import balance. And when the emperor of the, the Qing dynasty tried to ban opium, that's when the Western powers attacked, and it's led to what's known in China as the century of humiliation. Um, a century of humiliation when China had started to open up after years of isolation and despite their superiority about 600 years prior in the, the Song Dynasty time from an economic and technology standpoint, they clearly got to see that that, that advantage had eviscerated. Um, and China underwent a major effort to try and modernize, to catch up with the West, even going so far as to try and abolish Chinese uh, medicine. Um, and uh, uh, as a, as a, at this time here, we had a population of about 700 million people, um, still about 20, 22% of, of global population. 
Uh, that ultimately led uh, towards the Great Chinese Famine in which somewhere between 15 and 50 million people had passed away. Now, um, that's a, a very large number, but if we actually look at it statistically, it's about the same as famines that had happened in other countries, but you're dealing with a country of 700 million people, so the proportion of it just came to be significantly much larger. Uh, and that led to a, another aspect of culture, or perhaps synonymous with another aspect of Chinese culture that's very important, which is food culture. A colloquial way of asking somebody, as we might say in the West, hello, how are you, is you would say, nitsilama, which literally translates to, have you eaten? Uh, and this is a, a common greeting of uh, nicety in order to reflect some of the, the care for somebody's well-being. <laughs> certainly related to some of the history of, uh, of famine. Um, and uh, it's include also this quote here about just how important food and meals were towards a, a social cohesion and a culture within China. Also reflected, uh, by the way, if we think about um, San Nong, the divine farmer, the father of, uh, of medicine or of Chinese medicine, categorized the world's first pharmacopoeia. Uh, it's not a coincidence that he was a farmer who was also a healer. There's been this inexorable connection between food and healing and medicine throughout all of Chinese culture. Now, uh, I thought it was interesting as I was doing some, uh, going back through some of my old pictures in, uh, in research for this year. Um, this is a picture of me in uh, Yunnan province, western China, visiting the hometown of a friend about eight years ago. Uh, three of us about to sit down for dinner of a delicious hot pot. And what I wanted to really point out here is inside this hot pot, there's about one and a half to two kilograms of hallucinogenic the latest mushrooms. It's uh, amazing to think about there was no hesitation whatsoever um, that we would never consume these for psychological or psychoactive use. Um, the waiter was very careful to make sure to boil these for you know, 20 minutes so that it gets rid of all the dew. Uh, and I can't think of many cultures where there is not this reverential view of psychedelics as part of the ethnopharmacology, though there's more of a whimsical view. In fact, there's even nursery rhymes about consuming mushrooms and dying um, that's joked about. Uh, and, and that really goes to, to talk about how important the food culture is, as well as just the view of all food as medicine, as kind of this inexorable um, or, or uh, unseparable um, combination, which is that the psychological need is certainly secondary to the physiological need of nutrition. Now, uh, as I spoke also with Dennis when we were first preparing this here, I, of course, have to speak a little bit about this, and I don't mean to uh, give just a, a, a small preview of what we're going to learn about tomorrow from uh, Colin and Bryn around the Boleta species, but what is it exactly that I was eating in those two kilograms of hallucinogenic mushrooms? Um, I, it's not well characterized, but I believe this to be the Boleta speciosus uh, mushroom, uh, a type of, uh, of mushroom that sometimes gets characterized as porcini, sometimes as, uh, as an oyster, and... Uh, Paul will certainly love to have some conversations with you afterwards to see how it fits within your understanding of mycology. Um, these are mushrooms that often are, are termed uh, uh, as either jianso jing, which literally translates to they turn bluish green when touched, which leads many to believe that they're probably um, uh, psilocybin containing, or a shell ren ren, which literally translates to little people, as uh, people are known to say that they hallucinate seeing little people running around after consuming them. But uh, going back to the, the culture of a food culture and this cognizance around poisoning and, and cognizance around safety, there is very detailed records going back through Chinese history about poisonings from mushrooms. Uh, but very, very little that's actually been done around the research of the neurochemistry uh, behind these. Um, I, I list Amanita here because it's, it's believed that these boletus mushrooms are, are somewhat related to the Amanita muscaria. Uh, they grow in the same region. Um, but uh, very deep, uh, in-depth uh, details around uh, mortalities and poisonings that have been categorized. So uh, I, I, as I searched around here, I wasn't able to find very much data about um, uh, what are the actual neural receptors and neurotransmitters that are included within this belatus type of a mushroom. Um, there is in-depth, highly detailed, and highly uh, technological uh, um, organizations in China that have been focused on what are the, the hemolytic, the gastrointestinal toxicology of these compounds, because the concern has always been much more about poisoning. Uh, but there was one group um, uh, that uh, had published a study also coming out of a, a food science department that was more around the use of LCMS for quantification. I mean, I don't think they had all the right standards in place here. But what they found was, uh, was pretty interesting that the most prevalent compound um, was actually choline. You know, perhaps acetylcholine or, or a, a derivative thereof is, you know, again, without the, the right standards in place, we don't know exactly if these were accurate. Um, and also very interesting to find a, a fairly high component of uh, tryptamine. And 
Um, and is that exactly tryptamine? Could it be actually something like a psilocin or a psilocybin that's, that's contained because of the bluing? Um, that to me is also still a little bit of a mystery. Uh, I don't think so, considering how easily we could actually boil off the, you know, the dew, the poison, um, which in the case of a, a psilocybin is not quite as easy to, to boil off. Um, but um, uh, it, regardless, this is a very interesting uh, uh, mushroom that's here that we don't know exactly what goes into it, or, um, and I hope we're going to learn much more tomorrow about some of uh, the different compounds and how they interact with our neurology. So. Um, uh, although the last thing that I do want to point out is I list uh, uh, psilocybin on here with an asterisk because it had been believed to be uh, uh, containing and, um, and there certainly has been a long history of psilocybin use, which I haven't listed in the prior slides here, but by many of the Taoists. Um, and that was also similarly for the similar shamanic or religious goals of healing, transcendence, um, reaching this level of what we might call immortality. Um, but. Uh, uh, I segue that towards the, the next portion uh, that I want to talk a little bit about now is the, around the actual pharmacology of these compounds because this is an ethnopharmacology conference. We spent a lot of time in the ethno, but we spend a little bit of time on the pharmacology side now. Uh, what I list on this slide here are not individual receptor targets, but receptor families, and this is meant not for a functional standpoint, but to, to demonstrate what can we learn about the different psychedelics that have been used through Chinese history. Um, so that's why, just for ease of viewing, I've grouped them together by uh, G protein. Uh, and I list on the, the y-axis here the different compounds um, that have been uh, in use here, so psilocin, cannabis, aconite. Uh, henbame, and of course opium, just given its uh, prevalent use from around the, uh, the 1800s. Uh, what this chart represents here is not all the receptor targets or families that these uh, compounds or these plants uh, um, will modulate, but the ones that they have the highest selectivity for if dosed at the, at the effective dosing, so approximately like an EC50. Um, so actually we, we wouldn't use this for designing a pharmacology, but this does help to tell us a little bit about why were certain plants or certain compounds used historically. Why did certain ones uh, also stop after a period of time? And what does that teach us around uh, the way that psychedelics have developed in the country? So maybe just to point it out a little bit more uh, easily here at the top row uh, with the, the psilocybe containing mushrooms. Uh, obviously, these are highly serotonergic and what we would term to be classic psychedelics. Uh, but the use of these actually had been relatively sparse for about a 500 year period in Chinese history. Um, they had largely stopped after the, the, the depopularization, if I might call it, of Taoist religions within China. Um, cannabis, uh, which had a, was the original psychedelic used throughout uh, Chinese history, had almost altogether stopped by about 200 AD when aconite and henbane and uh, endotura had become much more popularized, both for medicinal treatment as well as for spiritual enlightenment. Um, not exactly what we might call a psychedelic, but I guess Andrew Weil correctly terms it. We might call it a, a drug as a class of its own, um, but the Chinese certainly called it a psychedelic. Now, much more interesting are the tropane-containing scopolamine, atropine-based uh, compounds such as aconite and henbane that had a 3,000-plus year usage, and even still in modern times today, actually are still used uh, medicinally. These are drugs that we would classify as being more delirious than they would be psychedelics. Um, as you can see that the targets that they modulate are more the acetylcholine, either muscarinic or uh, nicotinic uh, receptors. Uh, and, and certainly if I look at, uh, at opium, which is a fairly prolific molecule, um, but the, the one that it's, it's most uh, selected for are depressants. So why would there be a lesser use of psychedelics through Chinese history, but a greater use of delirians or depressants? Um, that's a pretty interesting question. Fortunately, I'm also not the first. Uh, it's always dangerous when you try and have a, a chemical engineer talk about history. Um, so fortunately, I'm not the first person to think about this question here. Uh, two prominent uh, uh, um, uh, uh, researchers from uh, the States both have, have spent quite some time discussing this. And this ties back to Wang Jitao's original question of, is it because the Chinese are so rational there has not been a psychedelic use? Uh, so Wolfram Eberhard, a, a former professor of sociology from UC Berkeley, and Li Hui Lin, who was a, a former professor of botany from uh, UPenn, had both uh, posited this same question as well, um, and really came down to something that makes a lot of sense to me, having, if I can uh, appropriate this term, you know, been Chinese my whole life, um, that uh, what has been instilled from this rise of Confucianism within China, or I'll use that Confucianism in quotes there, is a culture that's based upon a sense of shame rather than in the West we might think about our cultures as being on, based on a sense of guilt. 
Now, what's the difference between shame and guilt? You know, guilt in many ways can be a very useful social tool for having a construct in place for when we know what's acceptable and what's not, even with unwritten rules. Shame is when there's a violation of those same rules, but rather than it being a reflection of, uh, of a lesson, it becomes something deeply entrenched in, I did something wrong because there, there's something wrong with me, and it brings shame to me. Uh, and, and that, I think, for those who are, are close to uh, really anybody of Asian origin, that's something that we endemically all suffer from, um, which could have been very useful during a long period of time when China was trying to unify and grow towards a cohesive society. But are those, uh, those attributes and traits still beneficial in our more connected world today? Um, the, uh, oh, interestingly, also, uh, from uh, Li Hui Lin, who also talks about these use of drugs uh, and, and uh, the popularity of more of the delirians and depressants, if you think about versus psychedelics, these are, are drugs that will be much less likely to induce shame upon a user or his family. Delirians, depressants tend to be used much more in, in antisocial uh, occasions at home, which would then be much more conducive towards a society that's able to uh, look away and not look at those actions with shame, as opposed to psychedelics, which as promoted from many of the Taoist religions and many of the Taoist masters was meant for reaching this transcendence, this individualism where rather than having the sense of shame, each of us do have this intrinsic value. So from a, a pure utility standpoint, we can understand why one might be more useful than the other. So as a, a quick recap past this history period here, I think uh, I hopefully have a bit of an understanding around some of the cultural aspects of food as medicine and the impact of personal health care through traditional Chinese medicine as, uh, uh, as well as, uh, as the role that famines and toxicology, particularly in the case of a drug like wusisan, has had upon the development of Chinese culture. But much more importantly, this cultural embedding of Confucian type values of rationalism and intellectualism that have been soaked within our own society uh, for so many years, such that this dual nature of du, as whether potency or poison, has much more swung towards the, the far extreme that is considered today as poison and not as a medicine or a, or a potency. Now, um, what do we, you know, this is all interesting as history, but as business people, where, where do we go from here and what can we learn from this? Um, I, uh, oh, uh, before I go, go there, I also wanted to, to point out um, a, a wonderful, powerful quote from uh, Bo Shao, who was uh, introduced earlier from Kerry Turnville, um, the chairman of the Evolve Foundation, who's working with MAPS to bring uh, MDMA-assisted therapy to China. And he said something that's very salient, just to wrap this up here, that especially speaking of the Chinese people, we all have so much hurt inside of us everywhere, and so many of us develop these views that we somehow think there's something wrong with us that we're not worthwhile and we have no value other than the things that we do. Uh, and this, I think, really just crystallizes some of the point about the rationality of, of neo-Confucianism, of helping to bring the society in which we're all valued by what we do rather than our own intrinsic value. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, what's known now in business in China as 996 culture. Uh, that's the standard work week, which is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days per week. Uh, that's a, a common thought now, which you know, I, I don't want to say any of this to disparage what has happened through China, which is nothing short of an economic miracle in the last 20 years. You know, we have 800 million people that have been lifted out of poverty and joining the middle class, which is an amazing thing for the world. I mean, that's a, a tremendous success that we all should be celebrating. What is the unintended consequence or perhaps the repercussion we have to deal with that is now that we have 800 million people who are no longer focused upon surviving, but thriving. You know, we have 800 million people that are now trying to consider what in their worlds that they have to fulfill in terms of their eudaimonic needs rather than their hedonic needs. And given this cultural impact of your value coming from what you deliver rather than who you are, I think it's very understandable that we have a major mental health crisis that's coming, and if not already hit throughout China, and is recognized by many, which is why um, healing is as much needed in China as it is in the rest of the world. So where do we go from here? Um, I was uh, fortunate enough at Stanford to have studied under Paul Sappho, one of the, the greatest thinkers of our generation, a, a brilliant forecaster, who, um, as he taught us, as uh, Einstein would say, uh, if you want to look to the future, um, look backwards. So what I've tried to do here is map out some of the key uh, timelines and, and instances of notable um, uh, history from the use of psychedelics from China, from you know, the introduction of cannabis and aconite around 2000 BCE to you know, peak psychoactive use to when uh, almost all, all uh, drug use was, uh, was banned or ended around 1200 AD. 
Um, mapping that together with what happened in the rest of the world, um, so in, in green, we have more of the Fertile Crescent, and in purple, we, I, I've overlaid a couple of key um, uh, times, uh, time stamps in European history from the advent of, of course, you know, the Tassili Plateau um, to the discovery of Ergot, um, uh, of course, the mysteries of Oasis uh, prior to uh, the destruction of the temple by the Roman Empire, and of course, the Jesuits that then brought many of the, of the substances from around the world back to Europe. Uh, which led to a persecution of a witch hunt and ultimately many years later the ultimate uh, uh, ban through the UN um, Act of 1971. And we just add one more here in blue of the Americas, which of course, uh, you know, the, the key you know, dates that we have on here, the, the release of Reefer Madness and of course the UN-US Convention, um, uh, which led to the ultimate uh, 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 you know, future which we are in or have been dealing with for the past 50 years. Now, uh, looking backwards, some patterns begin to emerge, and more, more interestingly, what do we start seeing coming out of the, the future if we look from this period of uncertainty? Uh, and this is a term that's known as the cone of uncertainty, which is representing that the farther out we go, the wider it goes, because as we start to predict what happens out 20, 30 years from now, while we can't do that with any precision, we can do it with accuracy in starting to understand what, what type of useful patterns might emerge. And I've listed on here a couple of other societal or, or more societal and economic type indicators that I thought were really interesting from a richness standpoint. Um, so for example, in 2019, MindMed going public uh, on NASDAQ, representing the acceptance of the finance community and economics towards the development of psychedelic medicine. Um, obviously the release of Sravato as, uh, by, by Janssen with esketamine. Uh, and perhaps the one that was most interesting to me was in 2021, um, in, in my country, the United States, we have this magazine called Good Housekeeping uh, that's targeted towards Midwestern uh, housewives. They published an article on psychedelic therapy. And you know, that to me was really interesting as a societal turn that there is something that's changed that's really, really interesting as we're starting to see from around the 1970s to today um, that's led towards what comes next. So what are some of the patterns that uh, I started to see here? You know, Mark Twain often says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. You know, what has I seen that has actually begun to rhyme throughout some of these patterns? Well, across all cultures, China included, we had an early shamanic use of psychedelics for the purpose of healing, social cohesion, a knowledge transfer, and the definement of purpose uh, in what were really difficult times for humans to exist. And this was at a time when populations were fairly small. I'm gonna also very crudely, or perhaps uh, imprecisely, but not inaccurately, just use a single metric to define this as population density. So we had densities that were uh, less than 25 people per square mile. Uh, then as, uh, as civilizations began to evolve and become more advanced, um, we started to have this concern of exogenous threats to social and political order coming from outside countries as well as uh, as anything that might be a threat towards um, the dominant power in place. So as population density started to increase in more advanced societies, towards the final regulation or altogether suppression by the dominant power, um, which whether that be uh, a religious organization as we saw in many parts of Western Europe or ultimately government organizations as we've seen in the 1970s. And where are we today? Um, I would actually argue that perhaps the cycle has now reverted all the way around that rather than exogenous threats to social order, we're facing the deepest endogenous threat to social order. We have the same need for healing that we had for why psychedelics were originally popularized and helped, uh, I would not say use, but um, taking a cue from Monica this morning, but collaborated together with the development of humans. Uh, we have the same, perhaps the most uh, polarized time in our world's history of uh, a lack of social cohesion. Uh, a large nostalgia for days past, and while we have more data ever present than in history, I would not say we have more knowledge ever present. Um, and as the former Attorney General of the, the U.S., uh, Vivek Murthy, had said, the greatest crisis we face today is loneliness. We are in an epidemic of a crisis of purpose as all of us have to face our own existence of dealing with our eudaimonic needs rather than our hedonic needs. So if anything, I would say our history has repeated itself where the need for some type of a healing is, is ever as present as it was for when early development of psychedelics came with humanity. Now, a model that's often used by forecasters, this is from a, a, one of Paul's collaborators, uh, Stuart Brand, the progenitor of the, of the, the progenitor of the whole earth catalog, is a concept of pace layers. Uh, and this is to look at what are the driving forces that have been impactful towards the development of history and what driving forces will then rhyme and be impactful towards the development of future forces. 
Uh, and in, in this concept here, when we think about what will be most impactful, what's actually much richer is not what will be certain and impactful, but what will be uncertain and impactful. Now, for example, as we had with the earlier conversation today, I don't think any of us have any hesitation that we will have psychedelic medicine and healing. You know, that's not uncertain. What is uncertain is what will that look like? Is that going to look like a centralized top-down control where it's legalized uh, and, and regulated heavily by medical societies? Or will that look much more decentralized where we have something like uh, a decriminalization effort? Um, that's where we start having these much richer questions. Uh, and as I, I start to, to categorize, um, and you know, for those who want to, I will save you the, uh, the, the detail here, but in the appendix, you can review a little bit of some of the, the thought I put behind this. When I was looking at, at what are the actual driving forces across the different timescapes that will be most impactful, um, you know, certainly I think it's something else that's not uncertain at all, highly certain, is climate change. But that's unlikely to really impact us within the next 20 to 30 years when we're going to see a, a significant change within psychedelic policy. Where we have seen historically most impactful has been the intersection of government and science, technology, and society from how technology, meaning the development of pharmacologies, an understanding of a greater level of toxicity and a greater level of neuroscience has started to impact the different medicines that we have and how that's impacted our economy, how that's impacted our societies and the interaction thereof with politics and government. So this is where I dust off my old uh, uh, management uh, uh, consulting strategic hat and uh, put together a mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive MISI matrix here of key driving forces that fall in the area of politics and society. Uh, and the way that I've segmented this here is on the politics side, what if we had a future that was wholly legalized or decriminalized as opposed to the other boundary condition of purely medicalized? And then from a societal standpoint, what if we had a future that was purely based upon a trust in the medical society and the medical and scientific system versus one which is much more decentralized of, if I take off my old consumer products hat, what we might call kitchen logic. And I've created a couple of different scenarios as a thought process here. Um, let's start with the upper left-hand corner here of, of uh, legalization or decriminalization without the trust in the medical facilities. Uh, and this is what I call democratized nirvana. This is a future that I think most of the psychedelic drug developers would not want to occur. Um, perhaps uh, it, it doesn't mean that there will not be a future for psychedelic regulated medicine, but there certainly will not be as prolific as we might uh, expect from um, one in which there was either a greater trust in medicine or a greater level of centralization of medicalization. Now, who are going to be the winners in this area here? You know, certainly the, the libertarians, the, um, those that want open and equal access for all will be those that win. Um, I, I would say that uh, from a standpoint of uh, pharmaceutical science, it will become less dependent upon who has necessarily the best science, but who has the best marketing at being able to communicate. Now, what if we instead still have this uh, future that is highly decentralized, uh, democratized, uh, but there is still a, a faith and a confidence within the scientific and the medical community? That's one future that I will call Porto Oregonia, an ode to both the 20-year decriminalization effort of Portugal, what is hopefully unfolding in a proper way in Oregon, and an ode to a wonderful TV show, if anyone hasn't seen Portlandia. <laughs> um, this is a future here where I look at the, at the, the research and, and the great work done by many of the people in this room here, MAPS, UCSF, Imperial College, um, where I think this is the one that uh, they would most like to see. Uh, where we have no barriers towards the, the continued progress of psychedelic science and research. There's open access, yet there is still trust in, in an expertise or some level of a technocracy. Uh, and the losers in a situation like this, I might see would be like foreign retreats as there would no longer be the need to have to fly to Costa Rica or to Ecuador in order to go for your ayahuasca retreat as there might be a local option. Um, and certainly the underground market would not fully go away, but I think the, the, their stranglehold might be much less than it is today. Now in the bottom right-hand corner, what if we had a future that was fully medicalized and not legalized or decriminalized, but we maintained a trust in medicine? I call this scenario, Fauci gets a statue. <laughs> Oops. Oops. 
Uh, and, and, and this is an interesting one to think about here where I saw a recent poll from Adam Silver's 538 where uh, uh, was looking at the polarizing effect of politics on trust in authorities. And today uh, in the United States, Democrats have something like a 65% trust in medical and scientific authorities, whereas Republicans have something like a 22%. Yet if we were to actually back it up 25 years, it was the exact opposite. So where will this future actually unfold for us? I mean, that's a very uncertain but a very rich question. Now, who are the winners and losers in this scenario here? I actually look at this as kind of the opposite of democratized nirvana here. You know, those pharmaceutical drug development companies that are really looking for a medicalized approach, perhaps big pharma, they will be the, the winners, whereas you know, the, the libertarians and those that are relying upon superior consumer marketing rather than necessarily superior science will be the ones that will be losing. And last scenario uh, where we have medicalization but no trust in authorities, I call this uh, fake medical news. Um, and, and in this case here, you might uh, expect that. I, I think there will certainly still be uh, some level of medicalization, but so psychedelic drug companies may not be fully lost out, but the, the returns for investment will certainly not be as high as, um, as mentioned, many of us will hope for. Um, and uh, many of the winners in place here, you know, the underground market will do well in this case here, as I think many will be looking for a solution if they cannot have the access uh, that democratization may, may bring us. So why go through this exercise here? Um, and I can see from all your faces, you all had a very emotional reaction whenever I brought up these purposely whimsical names. Or if I, if I uh, you know, borrow from the language of our host country, I, I purposely chose these names to be cheeky for a reason. <laughs> like you all, I'm sorry to disrupt the bandwidth of our Wi-Fi here, but everyone please take out your phones. And for those that are watching the live stream at home, please do a little favor for me. And uh, come to this uh, QR code. I'd like you all to take a, a quick 10 second survey here. Uh, and there's two questions that I'd like to ask you. Number one, as a result of seeing these four different scenarios, which one do you think is most likely to occur? <coughs> and then number two, which one do you most want to occur? And while you're doing that, I'll help explain a little bit more why we do an exercise like this. Um, clearly, none of these scenarios will come true. You know, it, these represent extreme boundary conditions that are helpful for us to determine what an equilibrium will look like. But from the identification of these boundary conditions, we can start to identify some patterns, as well as we can start to identify our own personal biases. So why do each one of you have that emotional reaction when you saw something that was negative to you or positive to you? Uh, what is it that, as a society, we believe collectively that is holding us back from, for example, if we're in the lower right-hand corner and we want to go to the left-hand corner? Who are the coalitions, who are the advocates that we need to get on our side in order to influence, to bring about the change for the future that we want to see? <laughs> and uh, in about two minutes or so, I'll bring up the results of this. So thank you all for uh, partaking in this experiment. Uh, but I'll, uh, as we go to uh, a little bit of the, the planning side here, you know, as a, uh, American President Dwight Eisenhower had said, plans are useless, planning is everything. The purpose of the exercise is planning. We can start to see some patterns emerge as a result of any of these scenarios and the in-between. So I've highlighted in green here who are some of the, the, the common themes of who are the winners and in yellow the losers as a result of any of these scenarios. And you know, even in the case of democratized nirvana, uh, I might actually make the case here that suffering patients, you know, first off, uh, it's a hard stop. They will have a future where they're winning. And I think that is the one that's the most important for all of us here, um, regardless of what happens as a result of the, the work for the last 40 years of people like Dennis, other people in this room, uh, the work of Rick Doblin at MAPS and his team for pushing psychedelic science. Um, you know, I, I look at uh, like Shlomi Ra, CEO of Aloysis, who started a psychedelic drug discovery company in 2007, far before it was socially acceptable, popular, or perhaps even legally advisable. I mean, these are the pioneers for why we have this future that suffering patients will have a, a better outlook than they have today. Now, interestingly also, we never think about uh, this less than sexy view of, uh, of drug development, which is who controls the supply chain. Uh, we always think of what are the novel new molecules or formulations or, or new targets that we can hit that can help to lead to some really new novel therapy. But also common throughout this year is that we will need to have a safe, steady, reliable supply chain. And the API producers that are able to manage the GMP processes and, and to deal with all the regulations will also be winners on top. Uh, and you know, certainly a, a bit tongue in cheek to say that the underground market will be losers. I mean, certainly since uh, in my home state of California, cannabis is, uh, has been decriminalized and been in, in recreational sale for you know, more, more than a decade, I think. Um, there is still a thriving underground market 
So they won't fully go away, but I think the, the, the slice of the pie that they're looking at will not be as, as, uh, as it has been. So uh, I don't know if, we're, if we can actually click on this link here. If not, I may also violate the Wi-Fi just to give a quick uh, synopsis of where did we come out here in terms of what everyone thinks. Okay, so which scenario do we most think is going to occur? Uh, it's actually about a 50-50 split right now between Fauci gets a statue and Porto Oregonia. And which scenario do we most think, uh, or do we most want to occur? It's also about a 50-50 split between Porto Oregonia and democratized Nirvana. So <laughs> I think the clear message that I take away from all this here is that all of us hope for a future that's closer to the decriminalization side than it is to medicalization, although we're about equally split as to whether it's going to be um, based upon a high level of, uh, of medicalization or not. So where do we go from here? I, don't, I want to bring this back to uh, the original focus of some of the history coming from China now. And specifically, I, I want to speak a little bit about China, just because I think this might be uh, a little less uh, spoken to and a little less studied. Um, you know, there is almost no psychedelic use in China today, and that, that is legitimately the truth. It's often uh, the, the usage that there is still of compounds like uh, psilocybe containing mushrooms and cannabis tends to be restricted much more to the western side of the country and, and more occult uses. Not necessarily frowned upon, but um, not, certainly not popularized, as we might see within the West. Um, there are, are about 110 species of hallucinogenic mushrooms that grow within uh, China. Most of them are Paniala strain, so there certainly is a, a plentiful supply of nature that's, uh, that's there. Um, but uh, when I look at, uh, at where we're going from in China, you know, the, the Chinese government being highly centralized and top-down, they have the luxury of being able to do things like 100-year plans for the country. You know, I'm sure they've also done a similar analysis of this, and they understand, as has been the case for a while, um, who are going to be coming as some of the winners and losers. And I think they would be also very happy to see a solution for suffering patients. You know, they don't want their people to suffer more than anybody else. Uh, they would love, in the case of API manufacturers, to win, as I think we have also seen throughout years here, uh, especially amplified by COVID, that China runs a supply chain for everything. And that certainly is the case with psychedelics as well, or psychedelics or all pharmacology as well, that China is the supplier to the world of almost all pharmacology. Um, and I think they recognize that they will be the winners on top, regardless of what future comes out. Um, I think they'd also be pretty happy with an underground market disappearing for both uh, you know, societal and economic reasons. Um, but what might be coming uh, also uh, from China that I think is of interest? You know, this was fairly lost in the news going back to about 2019. Um, unfortunately, when you think about pharmacology and medicine, Wuhan is not the city that tends to be <laughs> associated with psychedelics anymore. Uh, but in 2019, the Wuhan General Group, whose uh, uh, American arm, MJ MedTech, announced that they would be entering the psilocybin uh, medicinal mushrooms market. Um, this is a company that you guys may know as M2Bio. Uh, and if you just look at, uh, is China prepared for psychedelic pharmacology? I mean, they have almost as many graduate level pharmacology programs as the US and Europe combined. So the answer is absolutely yes, it's coming. And is it coming just from China to be the supply chain? Well, uh, you know, you oftentimes know uh, China is known as the middle kingdom. Like, it comes from the name Zhongguo, which I may actually define more as the central kingdom. Uh, I expect China to take that central kingdom role and be not just the upstream producer of APIs, but also to get more involved in downstream. So you have maybe seen this article. It was published a couple of months ago in, um, in Science. Uh, this is by Professor Wang Sun's group at uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He wrote a, a wonderful, like, uh, amazing technological paper uh, just detailing the structure uh, and function of many different uh, psilocybin analogs. Now, it's actually intentionally called here the structure of non-hallucinogenic psychedelic analogs. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more, but something that I, interestingly that I wanted to point out, uh, on the left here, um, in China, academics, due to some of the, the scholar Confucian history, they're celebrated the way that we in the West might celebrate athletes. When this paper got published in Science, it was all over, over media, it was being forwarded regularly, and he was highly celebrated. Uh, and, and this was one of the, the articles that was highly popular across the NetEase, which is kind of like a, a China, a Yahoo of China. And the thing that most stood out to me here is what's, at, I'm not going to translate it, but what's at the bottom of this here that maybe stands out? That there says, Yi Du Gongdu, 
We said from the very beginning, fighting poison with poison. If I take one excerpt from this, uh, this article that's also interesting, going back to the non-hallucinogenic, you know, Professor Wong Sen is a brilliant researcher. He did his postdoc in Brian Ross lab at UNC. I don't know whether or not he believes this, uh, but as a representative of the most prestigious academic institution in China, he certainly has to follow by what the party line is on this topic. And he's quoted within the article as actually saying, to engineer hallucinogens, we must find their hallucinogenic mechanism to solve their addiction problem. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, going to debate whether that's right or wrong, but I think the much more interesting question behind it is why would he have to say that is, you know, similar to, to psychedelic coming to China and from China, uh, similar to the, the Chinese concept of capitalism, which is a little bit different from capitalism that we see within the West. I can assure you that the capitalism that we see is going to be a little bit different, or, or sorry, the psychedelics that we see coming to and from China are also going to be a little bit different from what we've seen in the West. But they will be coming. Uh, and uh, you know, if I leave with just one last quote here, um, the, the mental health crisis that's affecting the Chinese population has not gone unnoticed by the government. Uh, and they've been pressing within more of a kind of a fashion tweet about this, uh, become popularized uh, within modern lexicography, this slogan of returning to nature and returning to simplicity. Now, I want to contrast that with the dichotomy, which China is full of dichotomies across this non-binary nature of medicine and poison and some of the culture we've spoken about here. The quote that the kind of the father of Chinese capitalism left us all with that we most famously know is to get rich is glorious. And whatever future is coming from psychedelics in China, to China, for China, I can guarantee you that it will contain the ethos of both of these statements. Thank you all very much. Oh, as we open up for questions, also I'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll list on here a list of many, many references that I have to, of some people who were, were gracious enough with their time to spend some time to talk with me, even though it's a very difficult time for speaking even with um, Chinese academics, uh, and a number of different wonderful books, documentaries, and papers for people to refer to if you have more interest in this topic. I've got some questions. That was an extraordinary talk. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to say something a little bit sensitive and controversial, and I don't want to, it's not an insult in any way. It's an observation. Um, I have been to China. That doesn't mean I'm an expert on China, of course. Um, but I would generally say about 60 to 70 percent of traditional Chinese medicine on mushrooms is well borne out by science now. Um, but you know, 30% or so, just roughly, it's highly questionable. But my concern is the suppression of individual expression and experimentation leading to shame codified the five stone remedy, even though it's so incredibly toxic to be part of the doctrine of Chinese culture and I see the suppression of authoritarianism limiting creativity. And I just think that that is sort of a statement of fact. Um, the head that rises above the crowd is the first one to be cut off. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's an interesting dialectic. It's, 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 it's a diaspora, you know, to, to see so much tried and true innovation, you know, traditionally, which with mushrooms, and yet the inability of, of the Chinese authoritarian you know, paradigm to allow innovation for these substances is a, is a blatant contradiction to me. I'm, I'm struggling to find the words to, to express. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, Paul, thank you. That's a, a really interesting point that uh, if I put on my old tech hack, I'm from Silicon Valley, there's a very important distinction between two words we often confound that are invention and innovation. Uh, and and the, the way that technology invents in general across China, we may conflate sometimes as, is that necessarily innovative versus inventive? Um, and you know, I, I also don't want to make a judgment about which is better or worse, but what has China been very economically successful doing has been much more actually on the innovation side, I would say, rather than the inventing side. Um, will that be different with psychedelics as opposed to technologies where you know, WeChat, as a, as a contrast to uh, Facebook, evolved very differently into a very different product use case 
uh, a very different form factor that we got to see any less successful. We can make in the, the case in, in some ways that it was actually more successful. Um, how will psychedelics evolve in more perhaps an innovative rather than an inventive environment? I don't know. This is some of the, the fascinating, I think, where the, the questions are more important than the answers that come out of it. Coming up to you right now. Um, thank you. That was a brilliant talk. Um, and I was particularly struck by the idea of shame. I hadn't actually realized that and aware of the idea of harmony in China and obviously individualism in the West, which obviously comes from Greece. And um, I was just struck by the use of psychedelics in a, in a nation which uh, prioritizes harmony, but maybe shame is a key piece of that as well. Uh, feels like uh, that's why there's that maybe hasn't been so much use of psychedelics. I was really, really interested to see that. Um, you didn't mention Bon, the Tibetan um, shaman uh, culture, and I was just interested if you had any views on their use of um, psychedelics and also the Dalai Lama and, and the oracles that have traditionally been used in Tibet uh, and how they would um, uh, transcend and, and, and potentially use medicinal plants to uh, predict the future. Yeah, it's a, a fascinating question, one that I am by no means an expert on. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, that confluence there also came after kind of around Song Dynasty time frame when Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism began to merge together. Um, so actually much of the traditional use of psychedelics as a, as a means of reaching transcendence was not a part of Buddhism, but that came to be co-opted together with Taoism. Uh, and there certainly are shamanic uses that exist there today. Uh, I think more the ancestral part that we originally came to see came from more of uh, southeastern China as well as northern, um, where there's just a greater concentration of some of the, the compounds, meaning either like Amanita in the north or more of the Silvocipi cubensis and, and, um, and Deliriants uh, later in the, the southeast. So uh, kind of a, a long story short there of saying that, yes, there is a, a strong shamanic use. There actually still is today, uh, but not with the psychedelics, largely. Um, there are some more marginalized communities that have been using them. It's actually very interesting if you look at the way that many of these uh, historically oppressed religions have come to, to resurge uh, today. Uh, it actually has been with the sanction of the government rather than having been, been with some oppression of the government as a way to just kind of bring the people into modernity. So if you visit some of the, the, the Taoist ceremonies in, the, uh, in more of like Fujian and Hebei province, uh, they all open with a representative of the, the Communist Party coming to bless. This is the celebration of, of individualism and thought from the, the, the historic uh, uh, tribes that still practice them um, before they go off to then begin their own you know, kind of lip service for thanking the government. Hi, um, you said that there's a long history of use of psilocybin by the Taoists, and today there's still active use of psilocybin in Western China. Can you tell me where that evidence comes from? Like, I'm, I'm totally unaware of that. Yeah, yeah, many of these texts, which are also very difficult to translate, uh, in fact, there's a wonderful effort going on from uh, um, uh, NTU University in Singapore of trying to categorize some of, uh, of, of the traditional Chinese plants and, uh, that have been just kind of lost to time. Uh, of what they were used for. But going from some books back to the uh, one classic Taoist text that's known as the Biography of the Transcendence from 77 BCE, details a lot of, of, of high use of what are believed to be psychedelic mushrooms, particularly the Paneopolis uh, or Paneolis strains. Now, where they can be confusing is because so much of Taoism then became around kind of this inner alchemy, that many of the descriptors of meditation, of being able to see spirits and to communicate with your ancestors, and you float and make the body feel light, these are actually not from psychedelic compounds. So there, there's a high level of confounding. Uh, but we know from so many of the descriptions within these mushrooms that some of them were just you know, reishi, some of them were lion's mane, um, but some of them were, were certainly psychedelic mushrooms. And that had continued until about uh, 600 AD when uh, much of the evidence then just disappeared. So now, disappeared doesn't mean that the uses disappeared because much of the writing then had been done by more of the elite classes. We have very little knowledge about what uh, those who were illiterate or didn't have history written about were doing. Could they have been? It's, it's altogether possible. I would say probably likely as well. Um, and, and the usage today is, is much more recreational and kind of fringe. Yeah, if I could follow up on that question, you know, traditionally, I'm at the back here, 
Um, thanks for your talk. You know, traditionally we've explained the discrepancy whereby 95% probably of the known and regularly used entheogens have been based in the Americas or Siberia. And the explanation for that is not because of forests of equatorial West Africa or Southeast Asia are depauperate, but because people there have found other avenues to the divine. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked in Africa. Africans always said, you know, you white people go to church and speak about God. Uh, we hear that Indians eat their plants and speak to God. We dance in the temple and become God. And so that's been the kind of uh, the ethnographic lens on all of this. And, and in all of your research, have, has there been any... Just because a hallucinogenic agent is found in a landscape doesn't imply that people used it. And to what extent, besides these early, early Taoist texts, um, do we have any real evidence that these psychoactive agents were used? And if so, is there any contemporary ethnographic evidence that they are being used today? Among, among for example, the m many, many ethnicities in China. Yeah, those, uh, the, to, to answer your last question first, that one is much harder to find reliable information about. And I think those that would be willing to speak on record would be much harder to find. So that one, I would suspect the answer would be yes, just because you know, I hope it's part of my talk here. We Chinese are no different from the rest of the world. Uh, uh, it just, we, we may have some, some societal and cultural, if not uh, political reasons for why we may need to keep things a little bit more quiet. Um, but, but to the, uh, the original usage, besides the actual Taoist texts, I mean, similar also to shamanic traditions going across other cultures, there were burial sites where uh, uh, discovered where you know, seeds, plants were, were held together in very close proximity to the people. Um, so I'd say much of the similar evidence that we had found from uh, usage across the world were also found within China, just perhaps not just as publicized as much or really just not as studied as much. But there are many, many parts of the world where there's no evidence of the use of psychoactive plants. Right, so it's not a ubiquitous trait of, care of the human character. I mean, the, the desire to invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away in the wings of trance and get in some different metaphysical space, that's ubiquitous in the human record. But there are many, there are many, many ways of, of doing that. I mean, if you look at equatorial West Africa, for example, the manipulation of, of folk poisons is the most ubiquitous trait of material culture all through the secret societies of equatorial West Africa. But the only real regularly used psychoactive agent that we really know about. Maybe there's some in Namibia that we haven't found yet, but certainly it's Iboga and Ibogaine. But that's, that, that is the excep exception rather than the rule. Southeast Asia, all through Southeast Asia, very, very little evidence of psychoactive agents. Psychoactive agents, but not entheogenic agents. Yeah, uh, well, um, I, I can't say with absolute certainty, but if I go with a beyond a reasonable doubt from the evidence that we have collected, I mean, I, I'm led to believe from the text and the, the, the findings that we have that this was not just coincidental. Hello, thank you. Um, you said very, uh, with a lot of certainty that those beliefs were psychedelic. Um, how do you know? I mean, not from your experience. Where is that reference? Why that species? Because it's not very well known and it's not documented to my knowledge. The, the Boveda species? Yeah. Yeah, that one is also more of, I mean, no, no such airway exists within China, but there is a, a very long lore around, like even the name of it, of seeing little people. Um, uh, that, that has been captured uh, pretty regularly through, I'll call it more anecdotal trip, trip reports. But so, so you, the name is what leads you to say that it's, it has psychedelic um, compounds, or is it used, or has it been used? Is it oh, it has been used. It's, it's not popularly still? used, but it has been, been used with uh, enough documented evidence of, of, uh, of their descriptors. Yeah, I mean, just adding to what he's saying, the, the, there are cases of pe the, people don't intentionally use it, but sometimes if they don't cook it enough, they have these trips and talk about it. So, well, I saw these funny people, but it doesn't seem to be like ritualized or intentional, but it happens by accident, and those reports are fairly well documented. Yeah, I mean, the same goes for Amanita use as well. It's also like, oftentimes not intentional. I mean, certainly not a, a zero case unintentional, but there are many reported uses. 